Hello everyone, you're watching the channel Stories of Our Life. Friends, make yourselves comfortable. I wish you to truly enjoy listening to this life story. Stacy was still shocked. After a few seconds, she came to her senses and no longer looked with her eyes bulging. Then she explained, I'd love to, but I have studies I can't miss, the girl explained. You see, if you don't agree to my terms, I'll have to fire you and hire a new nurse, replied Kelly coldly, I don't want a lot of strangers in the house all the time. Besides, Harris will probably need medical care at night, too. Make up your mind. As soon as you think of something, call me at this number and I'll come down and see you. In the meantime, I feel like getting some rest. When Kelly disappeared behind the door, Gordon opened his eyes and looked at the girl. I hate to ask this, but I think you'll have to forget your studies for a while. Write an application for a month, and then time will tell. In any case, you can be reinstated in a year after your sabbatical, the man suggested. I hate to do that. But you are probably right. I'll have to make sure I don't leave you in the lurch, Stacy agreed. I find it very strange that you were moved home from the hospital so suddenly. Why? You've noticed that Chuck has already taken up residence in my house. He'll be able to finish me off here in no time. I don't want to scare you, but you're in danger now. And Brett is in danger, too. There's no telling what he has in mind. But Chuck is a very untidy man. I'm afraid he wants to blame it on you. You're a nurse. So don't give me any drips that come from the hospital. I don't need them now. You cook your own food and feed it to me. Your room is nearby, so you can always be with me. We'll do it this way for now, and then we'll see. After discussing a plan of further action, Stacy called Kelly and agreed to her proposal. While Harris slept, the girl had time to go to the kitchen and explore the house. The rooms in which the former master and his nurse had been placed were on the first floor. The master bedrooms were on the second floor. The windows in the Stacy and Harris rooms overlooked the garden. They were put in adjoining rooms so that the nurse would always be close by. A bathroom and toilet were in each room, apparently originally intended for guests. The girl stood in her patient's room and looked out the window, behind which there was a wonderful picture. The leaves had not yet fallen. In some places red and yellow patches of last year's leaves were visible. It had been wonderful weather for several days. Autumn was in full force, but it was lavishing people with the warmth of almost summer. Stacy looked off into the distance and wondered what to do next. She had been unable to get through to Brett. Thoughts of her grandmother's impending surgery also haunted her. She felt uncomfortable at the Gordon's house. About an hour later, Harris awoke and coughed softly. Soon I'll be caught up in this coughing. There's something cramping in my throat. Stacy, get me some water, the man asked. The girl immediately complied with her patient's request. It is good that you are awake. You know, I don't feel comfortable being alone in your house. I've been waiting for Brett all day, but I can't get him on the phone. Do you think something might have happened to him? I'm not sure of anything now, Gordon whispered quietly, let's hope Chuck hasn't gotten to him yet. Brett's bound to be home tonight. You bring him to me, I think we must tell him all about it, or he won't be able to assess the whole situation properly. All right, I will, the girl promised and went into the kitchen to prepare dinner. She knew that she would have to cook not only for herself, but also for her patient. The cook Lara met her in the kitchen, but Stacy explained to her that she only ate dietary meals, that she was terribly allergic to many foods, so she did not trust anyone else to cook. After preparing a dinner of steamed cutlets and buckwheat porridge, the girl went to her room, fed Harris, and began to work on his legs. She found that Gordon was quite good with them, he could move them and even try to stand up on his own. That's wonderful, Harris. A little more and you'll run, she said confidently, watching his legs. It's all your magic hands, answered Gordon, when Brett shows up, you ask him to get me a chair with which I can serve myself. Just get one that can be easily folded up and hidden from view. Brett didn't arrive at the house until late that night. He looked tired, even exhausted. 
Seeing Stacy at his mother's house, the boy was greatly surprised, but in time he pretended not to know her. It wasn't until close to midnight that he was able to come to Stacy's room to explain to the girl who he was and what he was doing in the house. Stacy, I've wanted to tell you for a long time, but I couldn't. The guy was the first to start talking about himself, but he was nervous and couldn't find the right words. Don't. I already know all about you and who you are and what you do here, the girl reassured the boy, but you'll never guess how I know all that. Tell me, the girl asked Brett. Stacy told the boy everything that had happened in the last few days that her grandfather had told her all about himself. And the rest could easily be found on the internet. Brett learned many interesting things about his mother and her lover. Brett was glad and surprised at the same time, glad that Stacy finally knew who he was and what family he came from, glad that grandfather had come to his senses and was on the mend. Though until a few days ago there had been no hope of his recovery. He was surprised at how foolish his mother could be, trusting Chuck. But most of all, he was surprised to see her lover in his mother's house. No one knew that Chuck had moved in with Kelly just today. The whole thing gave rise to some very bad thoughts. Stacy, I've had a very strange day today. I started my car this morning, but I didn't get to the nearest corner until I hit a pole and hit my head on the steering wheel, the guy began his story, I didn't have time to get up to speed. That's why the hit caused more damage to the car. At the service station, they told me someone had cut the brake hoses. Luckily for me, they broke much earlier than expected. I didn't have time to gain speed or lose control, but it's clear they were trying to kill me. Yes, Brett, and we can speculate exactly who did it, Stacy said confidently, Chuck knew you might have an accident today, so he didn't hesitate to move in with Kelly. You, like Harris, he had time to discount. Only there's no way we can prove Chuck did it, replied Brett regretfully, what do you expect to do next? Next, I suppose I'll continue to pretend we don't know each other. Tomorrow, I'm going to write an application for a month off from school. You'll have to stay with Grandpa the whole time. He can't be left unattended for a minute. We don't know what's in Chuck's head yet, Stacy replied, and anyway, don't you think it's time we went to see Harris? I think he'd be glad to meet you. The young men moved quietly into the next room. The grandfather and grandson embraced. Both had tears in their eyes. Grandpa, I'm so glad you're getting better. Just don't leave Stacy and me. Help her with everything. I know you like her, and I fully approve of your choice, Gordon whispered back. No sooner had the grandfather and grandson finished their last sentences than the door to the room opened. Kelly and Chuck appeared so unexpectedly that Brett had to use all his acting skills to convince them that he was fixing his grandfather's pillow, not talking to him. Brett, it's so late, what are you doing here, his mother asked in a disgruntled tone. The same thing you are doing. I was saying hello to grandfather. I didn't know you moved him into the house. By the way, I didn't know we had Chuck living with us now either, Brett looked at his mother with such a look that the woman had to avert her eyes. You're old enough to wonder about things like that, the woman tried to justify herself, Chuck and I have loved each other for a long time. That's why we decided to start living together in our house. We have a lot of space. I don't think the presence of my chosen one will be a hardship for you. We'll see in time, Brett replied, not trying to hide his irritation, but I should have been warned in advance. That you wanted to move grandpa home from the hospital, too. From now on, be kind enough to consult me on everything, not just your chosen one. The whole time mother and son were talking, Chuck stood in the middle of the room, glaring angrily at Brett. Stacy read so much hatred and anger in his gaze that she became afraid. She was afraid that Brett wouldn't be able to hold back and say too much. Fortunately, Kelly didn't pay much attention to her son and hurried out of the room with Chuck. Did you notice the way he looked at me? asked Brett to Stacy as Chuck disappeared out the door. That's right. He did his best with the brakes. Yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't agree with you more. Chuck is a scary man, Stacy agreed with him. It's getting late, Harris interjected into their dialogue, I suggest we take turns on room duty. Stacy needs to rest, too. Brett, stay with me in three hours. 
Stacy will take over for you. The young men all did as their grandfather demanded. Stacy knew that Brett was also very tired, but she didn't argue. Fortunately, the night passed quietly. In the morning Chuck left for the office, and Kelly stayed for a short time, not finding her son in his room. She decided to look for him in Gramps' sick room and was not mistaken in her guess. Brett, don't you think it should be the nurse sitting next to Grandpa, not you? The master of the house should do other things. No, mother. I am the master of the house, so I decide with whom and how long I stay, Brett answered his mother sharply. During their conversation, they didn't notice Stacy enter the room with breakfast in her hands. Son, I understand that you are annoyed by everything that is going on. You haven't had time to get used to Chuck yet. But don't get me wrong, I'm trying to do everything I can for your successful future. Tonight we're having dinner with the Smiths. Please don't be late. I'll expect you home at 6 p.m. sharp. It's the Smiths again, said Brett. Come on, once again, please, please look out for Kimberly. She's a wonderful girl and a perfect match for you, Kelly continued her speech as if nothing had happened. Noticing her son's displeased look, the woman hurried out of the room and bumped into Stacy. Be careful, she said rudely to the girl and left the room. Who's Kimberly? The girl questioned, once she was sure no one but Harris could hear them. Kimberly, as if a little embarrassed asked Brett, never mind. It's the daughter of friends of our family. Nothing else. My mother doesn't think so, though. After discussing a few more topics, Stacy hurried off to college, while Brett stayed beside his grandfather's bed. An hour or two later, the girl returned and reported that she had written an application to be excused from classes for a month. She spent the rest of the day in Gordon's room. After making sure no one was in the house, Stacy helped him out of bed. Harris wasn't making much progress yet, but she noted great progress in his rehabilitation. Gordon couldn't wait to get back on his feet and prove to everyone around him that it was too soon to write him off. The evening at the Gordon's house was uneventful. Kelly was expecting guests, was very nervous and infected everyone around her with her mood. Even Chuck seemed to be acting out of character. At exactly 6 p.m. the guests showed up on the doorstep. The Smiths came in full company. It was obvious that Kimberly had prepared for her visit very carefully. The girl put on another tight-fitting short dress, let her hair down and began to make eyes at Brett from the doorstep. Once again the boy had to endure the girl's presence and looked forward to the end of the whole circus. Stacy sat quietly in Harris's room and tried to calm down. She realized that Kelly had not made conversation about a certain Kimberly for nothing this morning. The girl clearly realized how much she cared for Brett and didn't want to share him with anyone else. She stealthily made her way to the next room to the living room, where she could see everything going on without being seen. Seeing the bright brown hair next to Brett made Stacy want to close her eyes and evaporate, but it wasn't that easy. The people gathered around the table were laughing and joking loudly. They were served gourmet food and drinks. Kelly clearly invited guests for a reason. Her demeanor and voice were so flip and gracious that Stacy immediately realized that the woman was trying her best to please the Smiths and marry her son to their daughter. But the main surprise was yet to come for Stacy. About 10 minutes later, Chuck and Riley Smith got up from the table and walked into the room where the girl was. The men sat in an armchair across from each other and smoked. Stacy had managed to hide behind the back of the sofa and was about two steps away from them. Well, I take it you've thought about my offer, questioned Chuck's guest. Certainly, but it seems to me to be somewhat ill-considered. I don't think Harris would approve of a deal like that, Smith began to explain his point of view, but why don't we take our time and think it over? All the clauses of our agreement. If the deal falls through, we'll lose a lot of money. And I think that all the papers should be signed as soon as possible, Chuck tried to persuade his interlocutor, as they say. He who doesn't take risks doesn't drink champagne. My only request is that you leave Kelly out of this. I want to do it the way I think is right, and then bring her up to speed. I want to prove to her that I can do a lot for the family business. But you know that buying this land can get you into trouble, don't you, said Smith again, before you buy land to build on, you have to check it carefully. 
In this case they say, measure twice, cut once. And I feel this lot is worth buying immediately, before there's another bidder, Chuck stood his ground. Then it's a deal, agreed Smith, let's sign all the papers as early as tomorrow. But remember, you pay 75% of the purchase price. Great. Chuck rejoiced, and even rubbed his hands together with pleasure, I knew you were worth doing business with. Riley Smith left the room. Chuck remained seated in his chair. I'll think of another way to trick you, whispered Chuck quietly, looking after his business partner. Soon I'll prove to everybody who I really am, you'll see where I'll be and where you'll be. The man finished his cigarette and walked out to his guests. Stacy sat behind the couch for a few more minutes and cautiously returned to her patient's room. Harris waited impatiently for the girl, unaware of what was going on in the living room. When Stacy returned, he began to question her about everything she had seen and heard. The girl relayed everything to him without secrecy. Gordon was particularly interested in the details of Smith and Chuck's conversation. Yes, he's a dishonest man. I don't know what kind of land he wants to buy, but he does it without Kelly's knowledge, Harris suggested, stupid Kelly let him in on the family money. And now he does what he wants with it. I know Riley Smith. He's a smart entrepreneur. He just wouldn't talk Chuck out of a deal. Oh, I feel Chuck's up to no good. Don't be so nervous. You can't be, Gordon tried to reassure Stacy, I'll tell Brett. He'll certainly figure out what to do about it all. The girl sat at her patient's bedside and was herself very worried. Thoughts of her grandmother's surgery tomorrow were haunting her. But she wouldn't tell anyone about it. It made Kimberly nervous, too, who was hanging around Brett and not letting him pass. Stacy understood that she was very tired and wanted to rest from everything that had happened to her. But alas. When and how it would all end, she couldn't guess yet. Brett wasn't able to sneak into his grandfather's room until late at night, when the guests had left the house. Chuck had had plenty of time to drink, so Kelly took him into the bedroom and never showed his face again. Brett and Stacy had plenty of time to discuss everything they had learned during the day and evening. I saw your Kimberly, Stacy said quietly, looking into Brett's eyes, she's such a bright and extravagant girl. Yes, she is, Brett agreed with the girl, but believe me, she's not my type at all. I only love you and I don't need anyone else. I love you, too, Stacy admitted and looked at her patient. Harris was already sleeping a serene sleep, what do you think of Chuck? Do you know what lot he's going to buy? Stacy asked after a few minutes of silence. I have no idea, replied Brett, as it turns out, Chuck is so cocky that he easily does things behind mom's back. He's got long plans. But how to convince mom that she's let the wrong man in on her is beyond me. Brett, it'll be better in the morning, Stacy tried to reassure the boy, let's think about it tomorrow. In the meantime, we should all get some rest. I don't think we need to worry about Chuck tonight, so we can sleep in peace. The young men did so. Ten minutes later, Brett went to his room, and Stacy sat beside Gordon's bed for a long time. All her thoughts were with her grandmother. Morning came quietly. Brett made breakfast for Stacy and Grandpa. As it turned out, he was quite good at making porridge. Harris ate very little, but he was getting stronger and looking better every day. Stacy's efforts were not wasted, she was pleased with her patient. I wish I'd gone to Flora, she said, as Gordon ate his breakfast, I left my herbs there. I thought I'd pick some of them up when I came down for the weekend, but I never got a chance to visit my hometown. I know a great recipe that can get anyone back on their feet. You can heal with herbs, too, wondered Harris, how many other hidden talents are there in you? Not much. I'm just ordinary. I just dreamed of becoming a doctor since childhood, Stacy modestly replied. She talked about her family and grandmother, who was scheduled for major heart surgery today. All we can do is wait and hope that your grandmother will be all right, Stacy Gordon reassured. After lunch and class, Brett returned and released Stacy to the hospital. The girl was worried sick. At the hospital, she learned that the surgery went well, but they wouldn't let her see her grandmother in the ICU. When she returned to the Gordons' house, it was already dark and the street lights were on. 
As she ascended the stairs, she noticed, out of the corner of her eye, that someone's shadow flashed in the garden. Stacy shuddered and peered into the depths of the garden, trying to see at least something, but all her attempts were unsuccessful. Deciding that she was probably just imagining things, the girl opened the front door and went inside. The evening passed in the usual hustle and bustle. Another batch of medications arrived from the hospital. After studying their composition, Stacy realized there was no need to put them in Harris anymore, so she just put them in trash bags and threw them away so there would be no questions from those around her. She placed one of the drips next to Harris's bed. After a few minutes in the kitchen, she found Kelly in the room. The woman was clearly frightened about something and was hiding something up her sleeve. Stacy pretended not to notice anything suspicious and went about her business. Only after the woman left the room did she discover that Kelly had managed to inject some kind of liquid into the solution that had been prepared for the four. Stacy immediately told Brett what had happened. The young people decided that the contents of the vial should be submitted to the laboratory. This was the only way to prove that an attempt had been made against Harris. They did not have to wait long for the results of the examination. The drug was found to contain a potent poison that could cause sudden cardiac arrest. It was hard for Brett to realize that the attempt on his grandfather's life was his mother's fault. Stacy, we've got to figure out a way to save Grandpa and get him out of this house to safety, Brett said as they all sat together in Gordon's room. Harris was silent the whole time, thinking about something. It seemed that mentally he was far away, perhaps where he had once been happy and young. I think I know what might be the safest place for him, Stacy suggested, just don't know if you'd agree with my idea. Go ahead. We'll think it over together, Brett encouraged her, I think right now the farther grandfather is from this place, the better. That's my point, Stacy agreed, I suggest we move Harris to Flora. We won't be threatened there. Only, of course, if we can do it all in secret. Great idea, Stacy, rejoiced Brett, we need to find a suitable vehicle for transportation now. Yes, that's right, your grandfather's feeling well enough already, but it's too early to talk about a full recovery. I think I've figured out who can help us, Brett guessed, my former classmate Ian has his own auto repair shop. He knows exactly who we can borrow a car from. Who's going to look after my grandmother, asked Stacy anxiously, she won't be discharged for a while, and it won't be easy for her without support here alone. Don't worry, answered Brett, I'll visit your grandmother every day. We'll get to know her. Maybe she'll finally start to trust me. Mom and Chuck shouldn't be neglected either. It's not safe for you to be here alone, Harris suddenly interjected into the dialogue. Stacy will be worried if you're left here alone with these two people. Grandpa, I made up my mind a long time ago, replied Brett, I'm the only one who can save the case you've done so much for from Chuck. Chuck's just a crook who should have been put in his place a long time ago, so I'll stay. As long as there's no other way. Stacy and Harris realized that arguing with the young man was useless. The next day Stacy was able to visit her grandmother. She explained to her that she would not be able to visit her anytime soon because her job required it. The girl did not bring her grandmother up to speed on all her plans, she decided that it was not worth disturbing the already sick old woman. Melinda was sympathetic to her granddaughter's words. She promised to call her every day, and also warned her that Brett would come to the hospital instead of her, to which the woman also reacted calmly. She began to get used to Stacy telling her about the young man all the time and realized that he was worth trusting. The next night, Stacy and Brett waited until Kelly and Chuck went to bed. Brett turned off all the video cameras and they were able to roll Grandpa outside through the emergency exit. After gently placing Harris in the ambulance, which Ian had somehow surprisingly managed to get, Brett got behind the wheel. The car moved smoothly out of the way and headed toward Flora. The old rustic house did not greet its young mistress with much hospitality. At least, that was what it seemed to Stacy. She was used to the house always being warm and smelling of her grandmother's cooking. Tonight was different. The cold November night reminded her of herself. As soon as they crossed the threshold of the house, hastily wrapping Harris in several blankets, the young people stoked the stove. It was not until an hour later that the house warmed and came alive. Stacy felt like crying. 
Everything in the house reminded her of her beloved grandmother. She was far away from that now, too. The girl's heart clenched in pain. Noticing that Stacy wasn't feeling well, Brett tried to comfort her. Stacy, come on, you're strong and you can handle all the problems, he whispered to the girl. The main thing is that your grandmother is alive and under the care of doctors. I will bring her home soon. Right now the main thing is to take care of your grandfather. Don't forget to call me. Stacy brewed some herbal tea and got the breadcrumbs she had bought. During the tea party another two hours passed unnoticed. Harris slept peacefully. The warmth of the rustic stove quickly put him to sleep. A special massage, exercises, and herbal concoction should get Harris back on his feet. I'll try to do all that, Stacy said as she said, goodbye, to Brett. Neither of them knew yet what lay ahead. They could only hope that all would be well. Brett didn't arrive home until Saturday morning. Neither Kelly nor Chuck were going to work. When they saw Brett at the door, they were genuinely surprised. They didn't know yet that Harris wasn't in the house. It was about a half hour later when Kelly decided to check on her father-in-law. She probably couldn't figure out why the poison she'd put in the medicine still hadn't worked. What does it mean, she shouted from the room. Her voice could be heard in the living room and did not bode well. Brett was prepared for this turn of events, so he remained seated in his chair. Chuck, on the other hand, jumped up from the couch and headed for Gordon's room. A minute later, they were both in the living room, looking at Brett in bewilderment. Why are you surprised, said Brett calmly to them, you seem to have made me hide grandfather from you. Wasn't it you, mother, who tried to send grandad to the afterlife the other day? Don't worry, I have the results of the examination in my hands. If anything happens, I won't have much trouble sending you to jail. You'll be followed by Chuck, who's dreaming of getting his hands on our fortune. You may not believe me, but he does a lot of his business behind your back. So if anything happens, you'll be left with nothing. How dare you? Chuck gasped loudly. His face became blotchy and his hands trembled, you're just an imaginative, fledgling chicken. Don't listen to him, Kelly. He lives on everything, Chuck began to stammer with indignation and couldn't find the right words to justify himself. Why are you so indignant, Chuck, if you do everything honestly? Brett continued to ask questions just as calmly, if you do everything honestly, if you don't want to send anyone in our family to the afterlife and cheat, then you should act calmly. When Chuck heard these words, he broke out of his seat and jumped out of the house. Mother, what are you doing, said Brett to his mother. Don't you realize what a despicable man you're dealing with? Grandfather gave his all so that we could live well. He raised me, taught me a lot, always gave me good advice. Who's Chuck? Open your eyes and think about what you're doing. You don't know anything, cried Kelly, repeating the same words, nobody knows anything. So tell me, will it make you feel better, asked Brett. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. It was like I was crazy, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't realize how I got under the influence of that man, Kelly tried to justify herself to her son, just please don't report me to the police. I don't want to go to jail. I'm your mother. Okay. I won't do it yet. Just think what you could have done if it wasn't for Stacy, Brett continued to rebuke his mother, we've got to get away from Chuck. We've got to save the family business from his dirty hands. Kelly couldn't calm down for a long time yet. Chuck didn't show up at the house for the rest of the day. Nor was he seen at night. The next day Brett drove to the office in the morning. He wanted to check all the documents related to his grandfather's business. Realizing that he might not be able to figure everything out, the guy invited his old friend Franco. The guy had a college degree and experience in an accounting firm. It took a long time to check all the papers. Franco carefully studied each document, counted something and wrote it down in his notebook. Closer to lunch, Brett invited him to a nearby restaurant. The young men ordered a meal and discussed what they had already learned. This Chuck is a very complicated man. Judging by the paperwork, Kelly let him in on the business about a year ago, he said. The year before that, he was the manager of one of the hotels downtown, 
which is therefore the most profitable, Brett told his buddy, it's kind of strange how things work out. On paper, Chuck signs a lot of contracts with different firms, but he never renews any of them. And there's a lot of stuff in the books that doesn't add up. I can't wait to look at all the documents. Maybe then I will be able to understand at least something. The thing that amazes me most about mom, said Brett thoughtfully, is that she's been running things for years, has been able to get into all the intricacies of the hotel business, and all of a sudden she turns over the board to a complete stranger. Yes, that's very silly, agreed Brett Franco, I wonder about that. It took two days to check all the documents. Franco sat in the company office from morning until late at night. He cross-checked some information on the internet. In the end, it became clear that Chuck had managed to get himself a considerable amount of money through one day's work at the firm. After the scandal with Brett, Chuck was never seen in the house again. Nor was he seen in the office. On the one hand, Brett was glad he was no longer seeing this sneaky man, but on the other hand he was always on his guard. The guy knew that Chuck wouldn't just leave it at that and was sure to find a way to get revenge. When he finished his paperwork, Brett found a business card with the address and phone number of the Ice Mountaineering Club. He immediately realized that it was the club that grandfather had been a member of before his injury. Deciding that he had gotten his hands on the card for a reason, Brett decided to go there and find witnesses to the tragedy that had happened two years earlier. Finding the club turned out to be quite easy. A pretty girl named Valerie met him in the foyer. When he told her his last name, she smiled. Are you Harris's grandson? She asked, looking at Brett with surprised eyes, how's he doing? Slowly but surely on the mend, thank you, the boy replied, you know, I'd really like to meet the witnesses who were present with my grandfather at the time of the tragedy. Could you help me with that? I can. Talk to me, replied Valerie amiably, I was camping that ill-fated day, too. We were planning to climb another peak. We had spent several days in tents before the ascent. It was the beginning of summer, but the weather did not want to get better and forced us to postpone our plans. Why do I tell you about it? Because these days we had time to check all the equipment a few times. It seemed like we had never prepared as thoroughly as we did this time. How it was possible that Harris didn't check the safety ropes, I still don't know. Yeah, that doesn't sound like Grandpa, Brett agreed with the girl, but tell me, Valerie, couldn't someone in the group have damaged the ropes on purpose? Maybe Grandpa had some ill-wishers he didn't get along with very well? What are you saying? He was the soul of our club. Harris was one of our most experienced climbers. We all looked up to him and admired him. Although, you must admit, often enemies don't make themselves known and do their dirty deeds under the radar. That's what I mean, Brett confirmed the girl's words, maybe you still have some pictures from those years? May I see them? Oh, pictures. We have lots of them, said Valerie, no climbing is without a photo session. It is so many interesting memories. Let me show you to the office. There are lots of different pictures to look at on our computer. Valerie led the guy into one of the offices, which had a computer in addition to various climbing equipment spread out in drawers. There were pictures hanging over the computer table as well. Brett eagerly turned on the monitor and began examining the photo folders with the expedition dates marked on them. Finding the right date, the guy clicked on the file and began flipping through the images. The pictures had different people in them that he had never met before. People were smiling. You could guess from their happy faces that they truly loved mountain climbing and enjoyed climbing the mountains. There were a lot of pictures. It seemed to Brett that it would be impossible to find anything of real value among them. But suddenly one of them caught his attention. He noticed a familiar face among several women. The man was standing off to the side, so it was hard to see his features clearly. Brett looked closely. There could be no mistake. In the photograph he recognized Chuck. What was he missing among the climbers? I never thought he'd ever been interested in that sport, Brett said to himself, I'll have to study the rest of the pictures. Maybe he was a member of the club before. To dispel his suspicions, Brett studied photo files from two years before the tragedy and two years after. None of the photos showed Chuck anymore. 
Brett became more and more convinced that Chuck had been responsible for the tragedy that had befallen his grandfather two years earlier. After downloading the right photo and taking a screenshot of the date of the document, Brett left the office. Valerie was still sitting in the foyer, writing something in her journal. Valerie, I'm interested in one photo, the guy turned to the girl, could you take a look at it and remember one person? I'd be happy to help in any way I can, the girl replied and walked into the office following Brett. When she saw the picture, it took her a long time to remember the man who was standing apart from the rest of the group. Unfortunately, it's been a while, but if he was often with us on hikes and became a club member, I would certainly remember him," Valerie replied thoughtfully. Is it ever the case that complete strangers go camping with you?" inquired Brett, of course it is. People come in, explore, look around, even hike with us. Many after that sign up for the club and can no longer live without mountaineering. And someone, on the contrary, understands that mountaineering is not his case. It is possible to understand it only by becoming a participant of one expedition. Most likely, this man was just of this kind. He went there once and understood that he didn't want to link himself to our hobby. Brett seemed to think the girl remembered something, or was trying to remember. I think I can help you, she reported cheerfully, I recall that this man was with us on the expedition with Luke. He introduced him to us as his friend, who is very much looking forward to being on a real expedition. Yes. That's right. Well done, Valerie, praised the girl Brett, and where can I find this Luke? I'd like to talk to him. Unfortunately, a year ago he stopped attending the club and no longer went on expeditions, the girl informed him, but if you'd like, I can look up his address in the database. Of course I do, answered Brett eagerly, I'd be very grateful for your help. The girl picked up the thick folders of papers from the archives and began flipping through them. Here, I found it, she announced, Pahrump Township, 9 Amarillo Street. If I'm not mistaken, this township is not far from the city. Thank you, Valerie, thanked his new friend Brett, you've been very helpful. I'll be sure to contact you if I find out anything. Brett put Valerie's number in his phone book and hurried to his car. An unexpected call brought him back to reality. Stacy's number popped up on the screen, which he was very happy about. After letting his beloved know that he was all right, Brett drove to the village of Pahrump. The weather outside was disgusting, the light rain had turned to snow, which was melting before it hit the ground. Many puddles had already formed on the road. If only this village had a paved road, thought the boy, turning the key in the lock of the car. It was not so easy to leave the city. There was still plenty of time until the end of the day, and the roads were already jammed with traffic. The bad weather had done its part. The first snow was a surprise to many motorists. Brett was able to get to the settlement only two hours later. The settlement in which Luke lived was most ordinary. After wandering a few streets, Brett finally saw a sign that said Amarillo. As he suspected, there had never been asphalt on the streets of the township. Carefully avoiding puddles, the boy reached house number 9. The one-story brick house had been built recently. It was easy to see, since there was no fence in front of the house. Brett got out of the car, trying not to step in a puddle of mud. He approached the house. No one seemed to live in it. Only the smoke from the chimney suggested that someone was in the house. Climbing the rickety stairs, Brett knocked on the door. The owner didn't open for a long time. Only after several attempts to get through to the owners did the guy hear the sound of a key turning in the keyhole. When the door opened, Brett saw a short woman of about 45, who looked at him in surprise. Who are you? Who do you want? I thought it was Luke back, the woman wailed, back again, you never know when. And I'm just the one who needs Luke, explained Brett, where can I find him? And I'd like to know where he is, replied the woman, I was hoping to marry him. I thought I'd marry a decent man, have a family and a house. We've been together for three years. I don't expect anything good from him anymore. They started to build a house, but it's not finished yet. I am sorry. My name is Brett. I'd really like to see Luke. Where is he usually at this time? Where does he work? Works? Don't be ridiculous. 
He hasn't worked anywhere for a long time, he does odd jobs, like chopping wood or fixing the barn. He hasn't had a house built in two years. Anything at all, he asks me, Stephanie, to do everything, but he can't do anything, continued to complain about the fate of the woman. Look, Stephanie, that's your name, isn't it? Brett continued to ask, if he comes back, would you give him my phone number, please? Tell him to call me. I need to know something urgently from him. Believe me, I'll thank him generously for the information I get. And what information are you talking about? What are you trying to find out, said Stephanie nervously, I won't give him anything. You ask him first, and then you send him to jail. He reminds me of jail so often. What do you mean? I didn't mean that at all, Brett tried to reassure the woman. But Stephanie could no longer control herself. The woman sat down on an old stool and covered her face with her hands. Brett didn't know what to do. He was standing in a hallway that had no repairs, the walls hadn't even had time to be plastered, the floors were concrete, and instead of a chandelier an ordinary light bulb hung from the ceiling, the power of which was so weak that it barely illuminated the small room. When the woman recovered a little, Brett apologized for the inconvenience and left the house. Where to go, where to look for Luke, he did not know. It was dusk outside. Settling in the seat of his car, the guy pressed the pedal and drove slowly along the muddy road. After about 200 meters he noticed a modest building with an unassuming cafe sign. Remembering that he hadn't eaten anything since this morning, Brett decided to stop and have dinner. He parked his Lexus on the side of the road and went into the half-empty cafe. The small room was surprisingly cozy and warm, and most importantly, it smelled of aromatic pastries and some kind of spices. There were almost no visitors in the hall. At one of the tables sat two young girls, at the farthest table in the corner an elderly man was waiting for his order. Good evening. We are glad to see you in our cafe, politely turned to Brett the girl behind the bar, would you like to have dinner? We can offer you wonderful home-cooked meals. Yes, be so kind as to bring a menu, asked Brett and settled down at the nearest table. It didn't take long for the girl to arrive. Choosing pilaf, fresh vegetable salad, and black coffee without sugar, Brett waited impatiently for the meal to begin. Ten minutes later, the meal was on his table. The guy noticed with what interest the girl waitress was looking at him. He decided to talk to her, hoping to find out information about Luke's family. The village of Pahrump was small, so its inhabitants must know at least something about each other, if not everything. Young lady, excuse me, could you help me, Brett said to the waitress. Yes, of course. What can I do for you? Would you like to order something else, she asked. No, my request is of a slightly different nature. Do you happen to know Luke or his wife Stephanie? They live on Amarillo Street. Yes, I know them. I just don't know them that well. As far as I know, they moved to Pahrump about two years ago, started building a house, even almost finished it. Only now the construction has come to a standstill. Hasn't built anything in almost a year. Luke goes out more, drinks a lot. Stephanie's always complaining about him, as if anyone cares about her worries and concerns. Who doesn't have those worries? Only all their problems to keep to themselves, and she just as starts about their misfortunes to tell people, will not stop. That's her nature. I see, but do you know where they moved to Pahrump from? They said they came from a neighboring town, said the talkative girl, but what did they have to lose in our backwoods? Why did they have to leave their usual place and start from scratch? I wouldn't trade city life for country life for anything. I'll save some money and leave here too. And you eat your pilaf. Our cook makes it really good. After listening to the waitress, Brett began to eat his dinner. The food was indeed expertly prepared. The girl did not tell him much about Luke's family, but even from what he learned it was clear that Luke had moved to the village with the hope of starting a new life in the new place. He even began to build a house, which has not yet been completed. What was keeping the man from doing it? So far, Brett was unclear. Perhaps he had lost his job and now could not earn money, or something else prevented him. After eating his dinner, the guy thanked the waitress and asked her to pass Luke a note with his phone number in the note. 
He asked Luke to call him urgently, explaining that it was about a climbing club. To be sure the girl would comply with his request along with the note, Brett handed the girl money for the information he received. The waitress thanked the boy and promised that she would be sure to give him the envelope as soon as possible. It took the same amount of time to get to town. Brett got home tired and sad. Time passed, and nothing worth learning about the tragedy in the mountains had yet to be discovered. He did not notice that a man in a long black cloak was watching him closely outside the house. The stranger stood in the shade of the trees and watched angrily as Gordon Jr. entered the house. Without a moment's notice, three weeks flew by. It was now winter in Flora. Snow covered the streets and houses with a fluffy white blanket. The villagers now often stoked their furnaces, in the mornings and evenings the smoke puffed out of all the chimneys. Stacy, despite the circumstances, felt happy. Sometimes she felt like she was still a little girl living with her grandmother. Melinda seemed to make her delicious porridge and fragrant scones. Only in reality, she had to cook it all herself. The girl not only cooked the food, but also brewed a herbal decoction, which she gave to her patient three times a day. Stacy knew that it had great power and could cure many illnesses and give strength and energy. After a few days of taking this wonderful tea, Harris himself realized that his strength was returning to him and the disease was beginning to recede. Gradually he began to get out of bed, using a special device to slowly move around the room. It is true, all this was given to him with great difficulty, muscles in his arms and legs weakened greatly. Stacy taught Harris to do special therapeutic exercises to get them working again. Not a day went by without talking and reminiscing about the past. Stacy, my Brett is very lucky to have met you, Harris said one evening, inhaling the aroma of freshly made herbal tea, you're a real magician. You must learn to be a doctor. That's what grandma tells me, Stacy said in encouragement, I'm already so anxious for all your problems to be solved so we can go back to town. I miss college classes and Brett and grandma. Of course. We're sorry, girl, that you had to drop all your business because of us, Gordon said regretfully, it'll be hard for you to make up for all the classes you missed. Don't say that, Harris, Stacy reassured her patient, I would never leave Brett in the lurch and help in any way I could. You've become so dear to me over the months. I feel like I've known you all my life now. Thank you, Gordon sighed and looked gratefully at his savior, tell me about your parents. They must have been wonderful people to have raised such a beautiful daughter. Yes, my father and mother were wonderful parents and must have loved each other very much. I was little when they died, but I remember how good we were together. They gave me so much love. Dad loved to tell stories and mom taught me to read. After they died, all the care for me fell on my grandmother's shoulders. She tried to replace my parents and always treated me with love, taught me many amazing things, like how to collect medicinal herbs. I started making different blends for decoctions myself. My grandmother says that I have a unique ability. I can't explain myself how I do it. Sometimes it's as if someone is mentally telling me which herbs are best to use for this or that disease. Yes, Stacy, you're very capable, Gordon agreed, you know, I look at you and you remind me of my mother. You wouldn't believe it, but my mother Tess used to heal people, too. People came to her with all sorts of misfortunes, and she could give everyone not only advice, but a bag of herbs as well. They helped in healing. Stacy listened intently to Harris and smiled. She madly enjoyed listening to her patient. He was not only smart, but intelligent, able to tell simple stories about complicated things, always had his own point of view on various issues and could give valuable advice. Now, listening to the story of Gordon's mother, the girl clearly pictured her before her eyes. Not having a portrait of the woman, Stacy imagined the image of a tall statuesque woman with long blonde hair and blue, like Flora, eyes, by which it was clear that she had an exceptional talent for understanding other people's pain, and doing everything possible to heal a person from it, and at night she had a strange dream. She dreamed that Tess looked exactly as she had imagined her to look as a girl. She walked over to Stacy, stroked her head, and smiled, You're doing all right, girl. You're going to be okay, said Tess and vanished into thin air. From everything she saw Stacy woke up and felt an unprecedented lightness in her whole body. 
she felt as if she were about to take to the air and fly. It was two o'clock in the morning. Harris was sleeping peacefully in his bed. Stacy lay there for about 10 minutes and then fell asleep again. She had no more dreams that night. She slept soundly into the morning. The next day, the girl went about her usual business, melted the stove, made breakfast. A lot of time was spent each day on massages, exercise, and taking medications. Among other things, Stacy decided to do some cleaning, wiping the dust and floors, cleaning the closets. On the shelves in one of her closets she found pictures of her grandmother, looking at them, the girl realized how much she missed her family member. She called her every day and knew that she would have to be discharged soon. The woman was under the care of Brett, who constantly visited her and brought her everything she needed. You look sad, Harris turned to the girl, noticing that she was quiet and thinking about something. I found some pictures of my grandmother. I haven't seen her in a long time. I missed her, said Stacy. May I see them, asked Gordon, I can't wait to meet your wonderful grandmother. Sure, the girl agreed, there are lots of different pictures. In some of them, grandma is still very young. Here, for example, in this one she's holding my dad in her arms. He's only three years old here. There's even a caption, Larry is three years old. Stacy gathered up the pictures and gave them to Harris. The man started going through them and fell silent. Stacy continued cleaning and didn't notice Harris's hands shake at the sight of the pictures. Flipping through one sheet after another, tears welled up in his eyes, which he carefully wiped away with a handkerchief. Having finished cleaning up, the girl busied herself with dinner, brewing another batch of concoction. Gordon pretended to sleep the whole time. He closed his eyes and thought about something. In the meantime, Brett was looking for ways to get Chuck out in the open. It wasn't as easy as he would have liked. The man had disappeared without a trace and never made himself known. Brett began to regret revealing his card so abruptly and telling him everything he knew at the time. Kelly had been feeling very ill since Chuck's disappearance. Her blood pressure was constantly spiking and she was suffering from headaches. She spent most of her time in her room and was silent. Brett understood that it was hard for his mother to realize the fact of the kind of person she had to get involved with. The boy thought that his mother blamed herself for all the troubles that had happened and therefore couldn't handle her emotions. He couldn't imagine how many different thoughts were going through Kelly's mind at the time and how many secrets she was keeping from her son. On Tuesday, Brett stayed at the university longer than usual. A session was coming up. He had missed quite a few classes because of family conflicts so he had to spend a lot of time in the library and preparing for practicals. He had already left the library building around 8 p.m. It had been snowing outside all day, so he couldn't leave the parking lot at once. I had to get a broom and squeegee and free the Lexus. Having cleaned the car, Brett opened the trunk, wanted to put the tools back, and suddenly got hit in the head, from which he lost consciousness. The guy woke up in some dark room. His head and body were in terrible pain and his hands did not want to obey. His hands were tied behind his back tightly. Brett was lying on the floor and could not move. It was not until a few minutes later that he looked up, with difficulty, that he realized he was in an abandoned building. There were broken bricks, pieces of hardened cement, cans and other debris lying all around. Among other things, the room was very cold. The boy realized that calling for help was not only pointless, but also ridiculous. Shouting out to anyone was impossible. There was bright moonlight entering the room through a small window, so Brett noticed the door, which was probably locked. Not without effort he was able to get up and reach the door, but with his hands tied behind his back he could do nothing. He realized that everything that was happening had to do with Chuck. Only he could have brought him here and locked him in the room. Reaching for the window, Brett tried to study the area outside the window. He was greatly surprised to find that he was on the sixth or seventh floor. There were no other buildings near the building he was in. The abandoned house was surrounded only by woods, which now seemed scary and ominous. The thoughts in Brett's head were confused. He tried to think of a way to get out of this story, but he knew he was trapped. 
A familiar voice helped him distract himself from his troubled thoughts. Chuck silently opened the door and looked at the boy with angry eyes. Well, you got me, he turned to Brett, standing helplessly by the window, thought you'd get me through, could you handle me? It didn't work out. I've waited so many years for this moment, so many years. Brett stared at the distraught man. In the light of the moon it seemed to him that it was not a man standing before him, but the devil himself. So much anger of hatred and desire for revenge in one man the lad had never seen before. Chuck slowly approached Brett and laughed loudly. His laughter echoed far down the corridors of the building, sending shivers down his spine. You didn't think you'd live this short, did you? Chuck continued his tyrannical speech, you don't think I'd let you live, do you? Your car's been at the bottom of the river for a long time. I was going to send you out to catch crayfish at the bottom of the pond, but I thought it would be more interesting for us to talk to each other and then be done with you forever. What do you want from me? asked Brett impatiently. Chuck stood a meter away from him, breathing heavily. What do you want from me? Chuck asked with a sneer, you know, nothing anymore. There won't be anything left of you in a little while. What did my family do to you? Why do you hate us so much? the boy asked. More than anything, he wanted to find a reason for everything that was going on. Well, I can tell you now, the distraught man agreed. Your mother has fed me my whole life with promises that I would be the one to own the Gordons. I've known Kelly for years. Much longer than you can imagine. You must know how much I loved her, I would have given anything to have her. But her parents didn't want a son-in-law like me. They had a rich groom Gordon in mind for her a long time ago. Who was I to them, you ask? Nobody. A nobody. Kelly didn't dare disobey her parents and married Gordon. Soon the young family had you, Brett. You have no idea how much I hated you even then. My beloved woman was not with me, had a child with another man, and I continued to love her and wait for her. I waited for her all my life. How did you hope to be the head of the company, wondered Brett, my grandfather owned the company all his life. He had heirs, my father and I. There were. That's the point. You're right. How I have long dreamed of destroying you both. But I had nothing to do with your father's death. The fool himself died, and I never understood what it was all about. You were too young to take over the company, so Gordon Sr. was the only one standing in my way. I kept going out with Kelly. We had to do it all in secret so as not to draw attention to ourselves. Several times I suggested to Kelly that we legalize our relationship, but she was still slow. So you decided to eliminate Grandpa with the help of his associate Luke? Didn't you, interrupted Chuck's dialogue. How quick you are. Already managed to find out even that, Chuck was genuinely surprised, well, come on, it's not a problem for me now. I made two attempts on his life. The first time he got off lightly after his injury. He came to his senses easy. You must remember. You were old enough not to remember that. After the second time, I was sure I could send him to the afterlife. But your grandfather was more resilient than I expected. More than anything, I want to know where he is now. I don't deny it, you've got me wrapped around your finger, you've cooperated with that Stacy, and you've done everything perfectly. Tell me where Gordon is. Is that why you didn't drown me and the car, rejoiced Brett, you think I'm just going to tell you everything? You won't. I won't tell you anything. Hearing this answer, Chuck was finally enraged. He kicked his prisoner in the legs. That made the boy fall to the floor and could not move in pain. Never mind, you'll lie here for a while and come to your senses, Chuck hissed in his ear, you won't survive here without water and food. Besides, it's supposed to get colder tomorrow. Hungry, dehydrated, or cold, is that what you want to die of? Answer. Chuck grabbed Brett by the hair and looked into his face. The boy lay there clenched in his teeth, prepared for any turn of events. In his mind, he was already beginning to say, goodbye, to life, realizing that Chuck wasn't going to let him live anyway. Forcefully pushing Brett away from him, Chuck walked out of the room and slammed the door behind him. The boy lay on the floor for a long time, not moving. 
He didn't know how much time had passed since Chuck had left. The highlights of his life flashed before his eyes. He could clearly see going to first grade, his dad and mom waving to him from the crowd, and him walking down the school hallway for the first time with his classmates in his new suit and with a bouquet of flowers in his hands. And here is graduation, when all his friends and himself began to consider themselves adults. For the first time they thought about their future, each wanted to find himself in life, to become successful and happy. One memory faded with another, until the image of Stacy appeared before Brett's eyes. Brett had never met such an ethereal girl as Stacy. In the short time they had known each other, the boy felt like the happiest man on earth. He truly understood what love was. Stacy. I guess I'll never see you again. You probably won't know what happened to me, what caused my death. But know that I love you and always will. I'm sorry I couldn't see this through to the end. Forgive me. Forgive me, Brett whispered the same phrase quietly and did not notice how he fell asleep. He woke up from an intolerable cold and pain in his hands. It was already light in the room he was in. It must have been 9 o'clock in the morning. With difficulty he got to his feet, Brett went to the window. The picture was no different from what he had seen at night. An endless forest, covered with snow, stood silently guarding him in an abandoned building, far from anything living. The cold made the boy's teeth chatter. It seemed as if he could not stand this torment any longer. Minute after minute, hour after hour, nothing changed. He could not open the locked door, nor could he untie his hands. Carefully examining the trash in the corner of the room, Brett found an old tin can, its open lid sticking out. The boy knew that cutting the rope with which his hands were wrapped was almost impossible and dangerous. But he saw no other way out. I'll be lost here anyway, said Brett to himself, I have to try to do something to get free. He pushed the can against the wall, sat down with his back to the dangerous tin, and began gently guiding the ropes wrapped around his hands over its sharp edge. Trying to free his hands proved difficult. Brett thought he was even sweating from the exertion and could no longer feel the cold. He didn't know how long he'd been fiddling with the tin can. His hands were cut in several places, but he persisted in what he had begun. It was already dusk when he still managed to free himself from such an occupation. His hands didn't want to come to their senses for a long time. They suffered not only from the rope, but also from the cold. He felt as if his hands were turning blue. In addition, they were stained with blood and when his fingers were able to move and regain their sensitivity, Brett tried to open the door, but, alas, it was firmly locked with a key. Attempts to open the door with his foot went nowhere either. Brett was too weak to kick it open. There was no way out through the window either, the small window would have been too small for him to get through. And even if he could, getting out of a seven-story window wasn't exactly part of his plan. Among other things, he was thirsty. The shocks, bruises, hunger and cold had left him with no strength left. It was quite dark in the room when the door opened and Chuck reappeared in front of Brett. He immediately noticed that the boy had managed to free himself. The enraged man struck his prisoner in the stomach with a swing and he collapsed to the floor. Did you think you could escape? No way, he hissed in his snake voice again, so, are you going to tell me where your grandfather is? Tell me. You have no way out anyway. Tonight I will end you, but I am kind, I will let you choose which death to die, if you confess. I promise that I will send you to the other world so that you will not notice, but if you decide to resist, you will die a painful and long death. Where is old Gordon? Speak. Brett knelt before Chuck and was stubbornly silent. He could see Chuck's hands trembling with impatience. His tormentor breathed heavily and wheezed with anger. Several minutes passed. Chuck stubbornly stood over the exhausted boy and waited for his confession. He was sure he had managed to intimidate his captive and would easily find out where Gordon Sr. was. But Brett proved to be tough. Losing patience, Chuck shoved Brett sharply and demanded he get up. The boy did not rise to his feet at once. His head was spinning. His mouth was dry and his body was almost insensitive. When he did manage to get up from the floor, Chuck demanded to leave the room. 
Brett thought he had never seen such a long hallway before. The boy walked slowly forward, not knowing where Chuck was leading him. At the end of the corridor they reached the stairs, climbed higher and found themselves on an open landing. A sharp wind nearly knocked Brett off his feet. Chuck led him to the edge of the landing and looked him mercilessly in the eye. Say, goodbye, to life, he hissed and pulled his gun from his pocket, I'm tired of messing with you. I suggest you don't hesitate to take the last step yourself. I don't want to do this thankless job. The boy stood at the very edge of the platform and mentally said, goodbye, to life. He knew that no one could help him. What are you waiting for, asked Chuck and pointed the muzzle of his gun at him, I'll count to three. If you don't jump, I'll shoot you. You have no way out. Don't do it, a loud female voice made Chuck flinch. The man turned away from his victim and turned his attention to the woman who had come from nowhere. Brett looked up and saw Kelly on the platform. She was standing in a light cloak, the sexes of it fluttering in the wind, I beg you, don't kill Brett. Don't kill my son and your son. It's your son, Chuck, the woman managed to confess and fell to the floor. A shot rang out. For a moment Brett thought Chuck had shot him. When he saw the mother fall to the floor and crouch in pain, he realized that Chuck had shot Kelly. The boy didn't notice the perpetrator disappear from the set. As he struggled to move his legs, Brett walked over to his mother and realized that Chuck had shot her in the stomach. Fortunately, the woman had her phone in her pocket. Brett called an ambulance and the police, explained what had happened to him, that he didn't know where he was, and described the building and the area where it was located. To keep from freezing to death in the icy wind, Brett picked his mother up in his arms and dragged her to the stairwell with the last of his strength. Hoping Chuck had already left the building, he sat down on the floor and waited for the 911 call. At Flora, life went on. Harris tried not to show his excitement when Stacy started talking about his grandmother. A few days after Gordon got hold of Melinda's photographs, it became known that the woman was on the mend and was ready to be discharged. But Stacy had been unable to reach Brett for a second day. A metallic woman's voice after each call reported that the caller was out of range. By the end of the second day, the girl was really freaking out. Thoughts of her beloved did not give her peace. Knowing that she could not do anything, being in a remote village, Stacy furtively cried, trying not to get into the eyes of her patient in those moments. But from Gordon's clear gaze the girl could not hide her mood. Stacy, has something happened? Are you trying to hide it from me? The man asked, once again noticing Stacy's weeping eyes. What makes you think that? I'm all right. I'm just a little sad, Stacy said, trying to change the subject. Don't try to fool me. I've been watching you for two days now and I know there's something wrong with you," Gordon continued to insist. Nothing can be hidden from you, Stacy sighed, and, unable to hold back her tears, began wiping her eyes with a handkerchief. I haven't heard from Brett in two days. I've been calling him every hour, but to no avail. I'm worried about him. What if Chuck could get to him? You can expect anything from that man. You're right, said Gordon, agreeing with the girl, we've got to do something about it. First of all, we've got to get you to calm down. Thank you, Harris thanked Stacy as she continued to wipe the tears from her crying face. It can't be helped, but the secret of my resurrection for a case like this, Gordon said firmly, I have good connections in the investigative agencies. I think it's time I got them on the case. I wish I'd done it before now. Harris asked Stacy for the phone number of the police station where his comrade worked. Once the right number was found, he immediately dialed it and asked to contact Neil. Neil, I realize you were in no way expecting to hear from me, but please believe me, it really is me, Harris Gordon. He turned to his old acquaintance, thanks to an amazing girl I was almost able to get back on my feet. But so far I've kept it a closely guarded secret. I'm not in town right now. But it's not about me, it's about my grandson," Gordon spoke at length to his friend, who could not believe that he was talking to a friend who no one believed would recover. After explaining exactly what had happened and who might be involved, Gordon asked Neil to start looking for Brett immediately and to keep him informed. He promised to get on the case immediately and find out what had happened as soon as possible. 
After that phone call, Stacy calmed down a little. Hope crept into her soul that all would be well. Not wanting to worry Harris, the girl contacted her friend Daisy on the phone and asked her to pick up her grandmother from the hospital and walk her to the bus on Friday. In the evening, there was a knock on the door. Melinda entered the house. Completely unprepared to meet her new guest, her sudden appearance came as a complete surprise to Harris. Stacy had no idea how unexpected it was for Melinda. The woman knew that her granddaughter had moved her patient to her house, but she didn't know who exactly and what his name was. When Melinda saw in the room a man with whom she had once been acquainted, she was not just surprised. She was shocked and could not believe her eyes. Harris, but how can that be? What are you doing here? It's been years, the woman asked one question after another. To none of them was she prepared to receive an answer. Melinda felt as if she were dreaming and that she herself could not wake up. Stacy, noticing that her grandmother was feeling ill, brought her a glass of water and tried to calm her down. What's the matter with you? Why are you so shaken by Harris's presence in our house? She asked in surprise, please calm down, you mustn't be nervous. After taking a few sips of water, Melinda sat back in her chair and looked silently at Gordon, who knew that this meeting was bound to happen someday. You see, I told you I would find you. And you didn't believe me. And I found you, the man tried to turn the conversation into a joke. Yes. But I was sure you'd never find me. I never told you about Flora and this house, the woman whispered softly, and when you moved here, did you know whose house you were going to live in no? Can you imagine, fate itself has brought our roads together again. I can't explain it any other way, Gordon replied. Can someone explain to me what's going on, Stacy asked, unable to understand anything, will you stop keeping your secrets from me? Yeah, I guess it's time to tell you everything, Gordon agreed, I was 20 years old when Melinda and I met in a city park. We started dating and were even thinking about getting married. It seemed like nothing could stand in the way of our happiness, but fate had a different plan. One day Melinda disappeared. I searched for her for a long time, but I could not find her. She had never left me her address. All my life I have tried to understand why she did this to me, but I never found an answer. And this house seemed to help me understand. It remained to be seen if I was right in my guesses. Melinda, a lifetime has passed, and we still haven't been able to say the main words to each other. Who knows, maybe God knew that I wanted to see you and gave me this opportunity by meeting your granddaughter. Bring me the pictures you showed me a few days ago. Stacy immediately went to the closet and pulled out the old pictures. Harris went through them for a while, as if trying to find something. Finally, he found what he was looking for and looked at Melinda. Stacy, please tell me, what was your father's name, he turned to the girl. Larry. That's what I had to prove, Gordon said, only his last name was supposed to be mine. Wasn't it? Tell me, was Larry my son? Melinda sat in her chair and said nothing. Tears streamed quietly down her face. Yes, Harris. Larry is your son. There's no point in hiding it now. Our son has been gone for ten years. He lived his short life without ever knowing who his father was. I'm sorry, but why did you disappear so suddenly? Why did you leave me? We loved each other, Harris continued to ask his questions. Well, if you insist, I'll tell you everything. Besides, there's no sense in hiding anything now. Then, years ago, your mother found out about our meetings. She found me and asked me to disappear from your life. She had plans to marry you off to another girl. I think her name was Vale. She said I wasn't right for you, that I was older than you by many years and she didn't want me as her daughter-in-law. She said that you and Vale had made plans for your future, but that I had ruined them completely. I knew at that time that I was pregnant, so I decided to disappear from your life. I really was already 30 years old at that time. To be honest, I didn't hold out much hope that I could be with you. Your mother only confirmed my suspicions. I never got married. I devoted my whole life to my son and then my only granddaughter. 
Wait, so Harris is my grandfather, wondered Stacy. It was a turn of events the girl had never expected. She suddenly realized that she had fallen in love with her brother. Melinda and Harris spent the whole evening over a cup of tea, reminiscing about the past and looking at pictures. They had forgiven each other long ago. To be offended by anything was no more. Foolishly life had passed, as only memories remained. I always thought I only had one son and couldn't even think of a second. It turns out that I outlived them both. How I wish I could hold them now. But, alas, that is no longer possible, lamented Gordon. Stacy spent the evening in the kitchen. Thoughts in the girl's head were confused. She refused to understand anything. Unlike her grandmother and Harris, she felt like a deeply unhappy person. She never managed to get through to Brett. After lying awake until nearly 3 in the morning, Stacy fell into a deep sleep and slept until 10 in the morning. Melinda understood her granddaughter's state of mind and even felt a little guilty about it. But she knew there was nothing she could do to help her. The girl awoke to a telephone call. Melinda had taken over all her duties that morning and tried not to wake up her granddaughter. The call was answered by Harris. Seeing the familiar name of Neil on the phone screen, the friend reported that Brett had been found and was in the hospital. He gave a brief account of everything. Harris learned what had happened to Gordon Jr. and his mother. Harris learned that Kelly had been shot, but the bullet had miraculously missed any vital organs and her sister-in-law was now under the care of doctors. After recounting everything Stacy had heard, Harris tried to reassure her. Don't worry, everything will be fine. Brett will call you soon. He's just very weak right now, but his life isn't in danger. Have they found Chuck? If not, that means he's still a threat, the girl suggested. Chuck's still out there, but he's wanted. I don't think he has long to run free. What on earth did he want with our family? Had Kelly promised him everything I'd worked for? Stupid woman. Gordon said, as if to himself, I realize you were misled by the news that I was your grandfather and that Brett was your cousin. Believe me, I can't believe it myself yet, but apparently it's true, and there's nothing we can do about it. We'll just have to accept it. But at least now I have not only a grandson, but also a wonderful granddaughter. Time will put everything in its place. Yes. It's very hard for me to get used to the idea, but I'll try. I have no other choice, she sighed and wiped away a tear. The main thing is that Brett is alive and we will be able to see him soon. Really, Grandpa. When he heard Stacy call him grandfather, Gordon couldn't hold back the tears either. He hugged the girl tightly and kissed her. About two weeks later, a car parked at the gate of the old village house, and a young man got out. He took many gift boxes out of the trunk and knocked on the door, which Harris opened. He was now quite free to move about the room without any help from anyone else. Grandpa. What a surprise. You're already on your feet. Stacy's a real miracle worker. I missed you all so much, said Brett cheerfully and hugged Grandpa, where's Stacy? They went out for a walk and ran out of groceries. Decided to go to the store. You look different. You've grown up, said Gordon Sr. It's impossible not to grow up in a situation like this, said Brett and thought about it. At that moment Melinda and Stacy entered the room. Brett immediately got up from the couch, put his arms around the girl and spun her around the room. Stacy tried to fight back, pushed him off, and ran back outside. The uncomprehending boy was left standing in the middle of the room and looked questioningly at Melinda and Grandpa. Don't touch her, Gordon asked him, we'll tell you everything now, and you'll understand why she did what she did. Harris and Melinda told the whole story of their youth, that they had not been able to get close to each other for so many years, though they had dreamed of being together all their lives. Brett also learned that Harris was Stacy's own grandfather, and that he himself was the cousin of the girl he had fallen so deeply in love with. After hearing all that his grandfather had been able to discover in the old country house, the boy sat in silence for a long time. He finally lifted his head and smiled. If someone had told me yesterday that I would be glad my father wasn't really my father, I wouldn't have believed it, 
He whispered quietly, looking at Harris, I'm sorry, grandfather, but it's true. Your son is not my father. I found that out recently at that very abandoned construction site where I almost died. My mother saved me. She followed Chuck and was able to get to the place where he was holding me and wanted to kill me, unnoticed. Mom only saved me because she admitted to Chuck that I was his son. If she had been a few seconds too late, I wouldn't be alive anymore. Can you believe I was the son of that mean, ruthless man? I still can't get over it. But it's true. So you don't happen to be Harris's grandson, asked Melinda, in surprise. Yes, so. Mom's on the mend, she'll be discharged soon, and I think she'll tell you all about it. I don't know how she could have kept it a secret for so many years, Brett reported. Without thinking twice, the boy went out into the yard and found Stacy there. He explained what had happened to him and told her the secret of his birth. Stacy listened to Brett, and it took a long time for her to come to her senses. The world was turned upside down for the young people. They both realized that they had lived their entire short lives in ignorance. Unnoticeably, evening came. Stacy and Brett sat in the kitchen and told each other stories from their childhood, particularly painful to remember the events when they had lost loved ones, Brett to his father and Stacy to both of his parents. What seemed particularly surprising to them was that all of these terrible events happened at practically the same time. We need to pull up the car accident case and reinvestigate, Brett decided, something tells me that our parents' deaths are no easy coincidence. The next day began with good news. Neil called and reported that Chuck had been caught and taken into custody. While the investigation was underway, the young men decided to go into town so they could be in touch with Neil at any time. They left Harris in the care of Melinda. Immediately after arriving in town, Brett met with Neil and asked him to pull the 10-year-old car accident case from the archives. After explaining the reasons for his request, Brett promised to assist the investigation in any way he could. The case concerned his family, in which there were many secrets and mysteries. The young man did not ignore what he had learned about Chuck's participation in the expedition in which the tragedy happened to his grandfather. Neil understood that he had a lot of work to do and promised to take up the cause at once. Stacy took up residence at the Gordons' house. The day after she returned to town, she began attending college classes. The new year was approaching, followed by a session. The girl had to make up for all the classes she had missed. She spent a lot of time preparing for classes. This saved her from hard thoughts and worries. A couple of days later Kelly was released from the hospital. She was still a little weak, so she hardly ever left her room. The young people understood that it was not the field wound she had suffered that was making her feel bad, but all the events that had happened. The woman didn't want to see anyone. Stacy cooked her meals, but Kelly hardly touched her. Brett was greatly worried about his mother. Despite everything that had happened, he loved her and wanted her to quickly come to her senses and start living as before. A snowstorm began over the weekend. The new year was only a week away. But in the Gordon's house, the approach of the holiday was not felt. Taking advantage of the fact that he could spend the whole day at home, Brett decided to talk to his mother. He knocked gently on the door and entered Kelly's room. The woman was lying on the bed, as usual, staring at the ceiling. She didn't seem to hear or see anything. Mom, I think you need to explain to me, Brett said gently, I can't go on like this. Tell me what it is that torments you so much. Perhaps if you tell me everything, it will make you feel better. Son, I don't know if I can go on living, the woman answered quietly, still looking at the ceiling, I've lied for so long, I don't know how to unravel it all. I'll tell you. I will. You can't imagine how long Chuck and I have been going out. I knew him long before I met your father. My parents were adamantly against our meeting and insisted on marrying Gordon. Three days before the wedding I realized I was pregnant, but I didn't tell anyone. Your dad thought you were his son all his life, and Chuck never guessed a thing. If I could turn back the clock, I'd do things differently, but it can't be done. I wasn't living with the man I loved. I thought no one would ever guess about my relationship with Chuck. But ten years ago, on October 5th, he caught us in the garden and realized I wasn't in love. 
He didn't say anything, just got in his car and drove away. He came back in a cab. Said he left the car at the service station. Three days later, he shot himself without saying a word to me. And you went on seeing Chuck even after that, wondered Brett, didn't what happened teach you a lesson? I loved him, so I couldn't give him up, Kelly explained. I was so blind that I didn't notice how he went from an ordinary man to a monster. I made him manager of the inn, but Chuck kept demanding more and more. I feared and loved him at the same time, kept promising him my place, but didn't do anything about it. Apparently, he didn't love me that much. All he wanted was my money. Mom, didn't you think that if you told him the whole truth about me, he might change? What stopped you from telling him the secret of my birth? Brett continued to question. I couldn't. You see, I couldn't. Now I know what I did to Chuck was wrong, but I couldn't change it, Kelly said and cried. I never thought he would get so mad and get you out of the way. If I'd been too late or not able to follow him on that terrible day, he would have killed you. He tried to kill my grandfather twice. I have evidence that proves his guilt. After talking to her son, Kelly did feel better. It seemed that she was only now beginning to realize the lies and filth in which she had lived her life. But so far she didn't know that she had indirectly caused the deaths of two more people. Three days before New Year's Day, Neil showed up at the Gordon's house to reinvestigate with the information Brett had given him. It was no trouble for the experienced investigator. Everyone sat in the living room on the couch and listened intently to their guest. What you are about to hear, of course, will not make you all happy. But you should know this, he began, because Gordon was killed in a car accident on October 5, 2011. The man was driving his Jeep at breakneck speed, not following the rules of the road. This caused a collision with a passenger car. He was able to flee the scene, leaving the SUV at a service station, owned by a good friend. He managed to cover up all traces of the crime. But three days later Gordon shot himself. Most likely, he could not stand the guilt of the victims. His comrade still owns the auto shop. He confessed that the day before his death Gordon came to him. The friends drank, and Gordon kept repeating that he had a terrible sin and the deaths of two innocent people. Time passed. No one asked about Gordon's car, so six months later it was disassembled for parts. As it turned out, Larry and Mary were run over by the wheels of the SUV that ill fated day. The perpetrator of the crime was never found at that time. The case was handled by an investigator who is no longer alive. I talked to Chuck several times. He didn't want to confess to anything. But then he realized it was useless to deny what he had done. We managed to get a confession from Luke, a former member of the climbing club. Chuck had contacted him a few years earlier and asked him to help eliminate Gordon Sr. for a while Chuck was even a member of the climbing club himself, keeping a close eye on how club members prepared for climbs, studying their equipment. The first attempt to eliminate Harris was unsuccessful. Luke didn't cut the safety ropes hard enough, so Gordon suffered minor injuries. The investigation decided that the accident was an accident, the climbers had neglected their dilapidated gear. Two years ago Chuck attempted the kill again, asking Luke to cut the ropes so that this time there would be no miss. The attempt did succeed, Harris was seriously injured, almost incompatible with life. Chuck was paying Luke a lot of money for the job. Luke wanted to buy an apartment in the city, but decided that with his criminal record it would be easier for him to live in the country, began to build a house, which he never finished. Chuck stopped paying him as soon as the job was done. He didn't get a job, started drinking, in a word, completely lost his taste for life. In addition, all these years he lived in fear that his crime would come to light and he would go to jail. Brett, your grandfather was very lucky to have a nurse. Stacy is a wonderful girl. She's managed to get Harris back on his feet. You're absolutely right, agreed Brett, hugging Stacy. You can't imagine what we had to go through to find out about all those secrets and crimes. I've lived in this house for so many years and I couldn't imagine how many secrets it holds. Kelly sat in her chair the whole time and was silent. Tears poured incessantly down her cheeks. The woman knew that she alone was to blame for all the troubles in the family. 
The man she loved had used her mercilessly. Though she, too, had been guilty of hiding the fact that Brett was his son. On December 31st, the Gordon's house was bustling. Melinda, Stacy, and Kelly were baking pies, cutting salads, and setting the table. Harris sat by the fireplace and watched as Brett was busy wrapping gifts for the whole family. Gordon Sr. understood more than ever in that moment what real family, love, and caring for each other was all about. Probably the same thought and feeling was felt by everyone else in the big house. Toward midnight the family gathered around the table. Brett opened a bottle of champagne and asked his grandfather to make a toast. Harris took the glass in his hands and was silent for several minutes, as if remembering what he wanted to say. My dears, he said, looking lovingly at everyone, all my life I, like you, have been trying to understand what happiness is, but it turns out that you do not need to try to understand it. You have to feel happiness. So now, I think this is the first time that I've ever felt completely happy. Yes, I was married. My wife and I were together only for 15 years. I tried my best to make my wife happy, but I truly loved only one woman in my life, Melinda. Life divorced us when we were young, but amazingly recently brought us back together again. What do I want to wish you all? I'll probably repeat myself for the tenth time, but again and again I wish you real, dizzying and boundless happiness. Appreciate and love those who are around you. Appreciate what you always have. Stay sincere with those you love, respect those you don't love too, don't hold a grudge. Always move toward your dreams. Stacy and Brett, you are my beloved and only grandchildren. I dread to think what would have happened if you weren't in my life. Take care and appreciate each other. To you, Kelly, I wish you found your happiness, too. You deserve it too. Happy New Year to you, my dears, love and be loved. When the chimes began, everyone started making wishes. Everyone had their own one, but it was invariably connected with hopes for a brighter future. An amazing story, isn't it? Thank you for listening till the end. I sincerely hope that you truly enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and rate this video. See you in the comments and in new releases.